Hey guys, this is Accounting Nightmare, and welcome to my Devil May Cry 2 Retrospective. Now that the LP's over and I've spent far more time with this game than anyone ever should, I feel it might be appropriate to talk about what this game did right and wrong in more detail. The original Devil May Cry was extremely well received, so a sequel was inevitable. However, this game was developed by a different team than the original, and it shows. While the team was obviously skilled, as the newer Devil May Cry games show, they didn't seem to really understand what they were trying to make here. It's obvious they looked carefully at the first game, but they seem to have overlooked the most important things that made the first game so great. There are a lot of problems with this game, but the biggest is the combat system. The basics are all there, but the combo system is different for no apparent reason. While the first game gave different combos based on the timing of your button presses, this game only cares whether you are holding the analog stick or not. This makes it feel like more of a button masher. However, this is just a small, easily overlooked problem. A bigger problem lies in the sluggishness of your characters. There's a significant lag time after melee attacks, leaving you open for counter-attack. In the other Devil May Cry games, you can easily go into a roll, dodge or jump to get out of danger, but in 2, you're stuck taking the hit. This is an especially annoying problem on Dante Must Die mode, when triggered enemies don't flinch when attacked and will usually counter you. By far, the biggest problem with the combat, however, lies with the weapon variety. The ranged weapon variety is actually pretty decent for both Dante and Lucia. There are only a couple mostly useless ranged weapons, submachine guns for Dante and the darts for Lucia, as the others are all extremely useful in different situations and against different enemies. So what lets the game down? The melee weapons. The melee weapons are very poorly thought out. In the first game, you'd probably be getting a little bored of the sword by Mission 9, However, that's when the game throws an entirely different weapon at you, Ifrit. Ifrit consists of a pair of powerful flame gauntlets. It's an entirely different feel to the sword, Alastor. It has different strengths and weaknesses and massively spices up the combat by adding a nice chunk of variety. The second game isn't so lucky. You do acquire new melee weapons, but they're all swords and blades and they all handle exactly like the weapon you've been using since the start of the game. The only difference is a couple minor stat changes, like range and power. The difference is honestly negligible, however. On top of this, you don't get any new moves. The upgrade system merely increases the damage you do with each weapon. The costs of the upgrades are also extremely poorly balanced, as they assume you'll be playing through the game multiple times on different difficulties, and thus will be able to afford everything by the end. Chances are, you won't stick around that long. The high cost of the upgrades, coupled with the fact that they simply increase your damage by an unnoticeable amount, gives you almost no sense of progression. With such a shaky combat system, the game really needed everything else to be solid in order to balance it out. The other aspects let the game down too, sadly. The environments are just way too boring. Throughout the game, you travel through a brown city, a brown cave, brown ruins, a purple city, and a grey factory. It's also uninspired compared to the gothic surroundings of the first game. The story is simply terrible. It abandons you for large stretches of the game, leaving you without a direction or goal. Interestingly, this problem is shared with the first game, however DMC1 makes up for it in so many other areas. Enemy design is also lacking. Some of them are bland, some of them are annoying to fight, and some are both. You have standard baddies like the Agonophinuses, which are actually pretty fun to fight, especially in large numbers as you plough through them. The other standard baddies are the Mysira and related enemies, which are ugly and irritating. These guys have poorly designed attacks. Some of them just come out way too fast, with little to no warning. Even on Dante Must Die mode, enemies of the other games will always give you some kind of warning for their attacks. However, it's not uncommon for the Mysterious to be standing completely still one instant and lunging at you the next. Savage Golems are simply horrible enemies no matter how you look at it. I'm not sure how anyone thought they'd be even remotely fun to fight, especially with their ability to break your targeting lock and simultaneously completely regenerate. Mancers really stick out as an unoriginal design. Evil wizards, come on. Thankfully, they're actually pretty fun to fight, especially in numbers. 
Goats are also a fun battle. You can combo them nicely. They have specific weapon weaknesses, and they're quite dangerous if you're not paying attention. Wolves are a disappointing enemy, in that they could have been a memorable fight. Fighting a pack of demon wolves could have been quite frightening if their attacks and movements were better designed. Sadly, they simply bounce around in circles while you slowly wear down their massive health bars with ranged attacks. Secretaries could have also been an amazing battle. The story, as terrible as it is, gives the opportunity for you to be pitted against evil Lucius, which is actually a pretty fun idea. The problem is that they're too much like Lucia. They can catch you in combos, and they recover too quickly from hits to attack safely. When you do knock them down, they even have the invincibility frames you have when lying down. That's not even mentioning their massive health levels. Thank god they don't use their ranged weapons too. It's also a shame they don't take on the Dark Angel appearance that Lucia's secretary costume has when they trigger. That would have been pretty intimidating. The game has far more bosses than the first did though most of them are of a pretty low quality. Aranguera, Tartarusian, and Plutonian are pretty bland, but are some of the more decent battles in the game, honestly, because they have a lot of melee action. The more terrible boss battles force you to attack from range. These include the horrible, horrible Dracat Golem Serpent Thing, which both Dante and Lucy are forced to fight, the Moth Nocturne, which, again, both characters fire. And the Infested Chopper. The Chopper looks like it has a solid opportunity to melee attack, but if you try, you'll most likely get hurt by its rotor blades. Yeah, it makes sense, but it's not fun. And let's not even mention that underwater boss. That boss is the single worst moment in this game. Some battles could have been great, but aren't quite Right there. The Bulwark fight needed far better camera angles, especially considering the range of attack he has. The Phantom fight needed to allow you to interrupt his attacks with stingers, like in the first game. A couple fights are actually pretty fun once you get the hang of them. The Fast Taurus, the giant building demon, has two distinct phases and a nice variety of attacks. Furia Taurus, the giant bull, it's a boss that could have fit in nicely in the better Devil May Cry with a few tweaks to his attacks. The Despair Embodied is one of the few fights where you really feel in danger, and its fast paced attack style is quite intimidating. If it just gave you a proper melee attack opening, it would have been an awesome fight. For all its downsides, there are a few areas this game actually succeeded in. The soundtrack is quite enjoyable with my favourite tracks being Phantom's theme, Bust the Beast, the Infested Chopper theme, Assault, and Furia Taurus' theme, Faithful Servant. The game also introduced an improved control scheme. Jump, slash and shoot are all more intuitive, and the addition of a roll button is actually pretty nice. In addition, you can now easily switch targets, and you can even switch guns on the fly. This control scheme is still alive and well even in DMC4. DMC3 made a few nice additions, such as adding the ability to switch melee weapons on the fly as well as guns, and changing the roll button to the multi-purpose style button but most of the control scheme is still intact from DMC2. DMC1, sadly, feels quite awkward in comparison. The mission select originated here too. You can jump into any mission you're up to on any difficulty with any costume, and that's a very nice ability. DMC1 lacked any kind of mission select, which really hampers its replayability, as you'll need to keep save files at your favourite missions on your favourite difficulty. And don't forget that the Bloody Palace was introduced here as well. In action-packed survival mode, the Bloody Palace gives you a nice alternative to playing through the missions. While the later games make much better use of the idea with more fun and engaging combat systems, it's still a very nice idea that improves the series as a whole. It is returned in both 3 and 4, and adds a good deal of replayability. It's nice to just zone out and take a break from the story mode for a while. And I really wish that the first game had it too.
While I'm listing new additions to the series, I should mention new moves, such as Wall Hike, Rainstorm, To Some Time, and Fireworks, all of which returned improved in later Devil May Cry's. The game also attempted to have air combos, though they are difficult to aim and use. This is also the first in a series to have a proper, different, playable character, though the idea wasn't handled very well. Lucia doesn't play that differently to Dante. Her combos are faster, but her evades are awful, and her melee attack range is terrible. She does not have a Desperation Devil Trigger, but has special Devil Trigger attacks instead. The biggest difference between the two is in their ranged weapons. Their default weapons are similar enough, but Dante gets the shotgun and rocket launcher, while Lucia gets the cranky bombs. All of these weapons are useful and different. There is also something to be said for the game's secret rooms. Yeah, they're lazy, tedious and unnecessary. However, every once in a while, they will scare the shit out of you, and that's quite a feeling. I certainly wouldn't be opposed to having a secret mission or two like that in the newer Devil May Cry's, as long as they're actually play-tested and balanced. I want to fight two Virgils at once. With all that said, it's pretty obvious that Devil May Cry 2 is the black sheep of the series. Though some black sheep really aren't all that bad, just different, like Zelda Majora's Mask, Zelda 2 or Metroid Fusion. It should be noted that Devil May Cry 2 is not one of those black sheep. This game is not just different, it's bad. It has far too many shortcomings, and that's a shame. It's obvious by the FMVs that the game had high hopes for itself, but somewhere things started going wrong. Well, I think I've covered most of the things I wanted to point out, and I hope some of you found it interesting. Thank you for joining me on this journey into the weak link of the Devil May Cry series. And if you're thinking of trying out one of the better games in the series in the future, go ahead and do it, because they're really fun games. Just remember to keep an eye out for Devil May Cry 1, Devil May Cry 3, or Devil May Cry 4. This has been Accounting Nightmare. Thank you for your time, and I'll see you later.